Hey, everybody. It's Jason. I know you've heard my voice many times in the podcast, and I'm here to tell you about something very interesting coming up. I want to let you know about an incredible opportunity for you to get free tips and strategies to build and monetize your personal brand. My good friend Rory Vaden is a New York Times bestselling author and Hall of Fame speaker, and he and his wife founded a company called Brand Builders Group. And they have put together a huge online summit where they're interviewing some of the most influential personal brands in the world on their never before shared secrets of how they became who they are today. So who's speaking at the summit? We've got Lewis Howes, got Michael Hyatt, Dennis Rodman, Kevin Harrington, Jay Bear, Donald Miller, and more. This is a rare opportunity for you to hear the stories about how they became New York Times bestselling authors how they built high paid keynote speaking careers, how they have grown massive online followings and exactly what they have done to create large multi seven figure businesses. If you're someone who is looking to create any type of influence, you have to check this out. It's totally free and you're gonna be learning from the masters who've actually done this. So I want you to encourage to head over to the show notes today. And in the show notes, I'm gonna put a link to the summit. Again, completely free, take a look at it. I feel super confident you will find it valuable. And now- Enjoy the episode. My guest on the show today is Stephen Drum. Stephen is a combat tested retired Navy SEAL Master Chief with 27 years of experience leading teams and executing mission critical performance strategies when success or failure hangs in the balance. Today, he consults with business executives who want to develop high-performance leadership programs that empower teams to achieve exceptional results when the pressure is most intense. To achieve this goal, Stephen leverages proven processes used by elite military units and world-class athletes. So that's the official bio. The less official bio that you're not going to see his, on his site is, first of all, Steve is a friend of mine. Second of all, Steve was a guest on the show in early 2020, when the world is a little bit different. And so this is another episode of Blank is Back starring Stephen Drum. What's up, Drummy? How are you doing? Hey, man. So good to be back. Uh, you know, I was just thinking you're, you're talking about that, and that just seems like a lifetime ago, right? It's kind of like that, hey, a lot's happened since then. What's kind of, changed? I, what's well, changed? You know, I, I remember what's changed for you. The first episode, you were like in a in a in a broom closet in Brooklyn <laughs> when we when we did this or something was. like that. Yeah. And now you are in the splendor of the cat skills. The splendor huh. of the cat skills. I've got a better podcasting setup. I'm I was just telling Steve I'm coming up on episode 100, so I have a little more experience doing this. It's probably always a work in progress, but yeah, I think we we recorded our episode I think in December of 19 actually. It was before the show officially launched, which means that things were a little bit different back then. Um, and since then. I guess what's new, you know, I guess look at me, we have a new dog, we have a new child in the house, we live in a different spot right now. Um, My daughter goes to a different school. (laughs) There's a global pandemic that's still going on. A a couple of things have changed. What what about you? What's changed since February or since February of 2020 for you and your family? Well, I I will say you, you mentioned December, like, I think when we when we shot that episode, it was you know, I was still, I was just leaving the Navy after right. 27 years and had just basically started my, my speaking business, my speaking consulting business and re- was really hitting the ground and off to a good clip. And then uh, COVID <laughs> happened just like everybody else uh, came to a, a grinding halt until I uh, started to pivot to the, the virtual events. And I kind of been doing those. And now, you know, it's great as I'm starting to get a lot more of the in-person business now. Yeah. And so it's good to kind of be back on the road. And I'm really enjoying that as well as, you know, I'm working on you and I were discussing this earlier, working on a book project. Yeah. And so really, you know, getting in deep with that and, you know, it's painful, but, but good, you know, when you get, yeah. uh, when you're writing a book for those who've never written one, you you know, it's definitely the ups and downs. You start getting into the content where it's just flowing and it can be very fun, uh, you know, when you're not blinking at that, uh, you're staring at that blinking cursor, but you know, it's good. Yeah. It's good. Yeah. And uh, things, things are looking up. That's awesome, man. Yeah. Um, I know you and I both know a lot of speakers. I have quite a few speakers on the show. We were friends with a lot of speakers, man. That was a, that's an industry that just got decimated for about a year by COVID because like people listening, like, obviously you're not getting on stages because nobody's doing in-person events. So 
kind of an instant pivot. And that industry kind of shut down in about one day. It felt like it was like probably like March 12th or March 13th that week when kind of like things started to shut down where it's like events getting canceled. So uh, admire you for your tenacity to stay with it, to do the pivot. Um, the second thing I wanted to mention is there's a reason I do a podcast and it's because I hate writing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, so I, I talked to a lot of authors here on the show and I just want to say, I'm sure your book's going to be awesome. I can't wait, wait, wait to, um, to read it. You said it can be painful, but it's going to be amazing. And I, to me, if I was writing a book, I'm like, this is just painful. It's just yeah. painful. I'm just not, yeah, a, I'm just it's not mostly painful, <laughs> mostly painful. Right. You know, I was having this conversation with somebody. It's, it's kind of like, you know, seal training. If anybody uh, is familiar with that, it's anywhere from a 75 to 90% attrition rate of people that don't make it through seal training. Ring the, ring the bell, really, right? That's ring right. And, and, or, you know, there's other factors, injury, and uh, you fail to meet the standards, you get kicked out, but mostly it's, it's uh, it, people quit. And, and I think the biggest reason is, is the enormity of that. Right. And it's similar to, you know, you would do anything like any people that go to medical school and are successful people that start a book and aren't successful. It's because you can't when you start off, you can't see that light at the end of the tunnel. Right. Anybody can write a couple of chapters. Anybody can make it through a couple of days of SEAL training. But it's when you look at the totality of, of the journey, which is where a lot of people get discouraged and they start climbing down that mountain and look for somewhere easier to go. And so, uh, yeah. yeah, there's some similarities there for sure. So, so what you're saying is your 27 years as a, in the Navy has prepared you for the battle of writing your own book. <laughs> I'd like to think so, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I hope so. At least uh, no matter how discouraging it may get in the weeds, sometimes it's, uh, I uh, will truly feel I have no other choice, but then to move forward and get it done. And now that I'm yeah. saying this publicly, then of course I'm, I'm, a, I have to be accountable for that. <laughs> That's it. I'm going to, I'm going to call this out in the show notes that you publicly declared this is getting done. I said, yeah. as, a, as an American taxpayer, I'm, I'm glad that the millions of dollars that we've invested in you has, one, done all the amazing things that you've done for our country that we can't talk about, but also that it's helping you write this book. You're so that's welcome. A, right that's a, that's you're a good investment. That's a good investment. <laughs> I, am, yeah. I, am, I am down for paying that. Um, so I want to start with something that I think the audience who heard our first episode is dying to know. How's it been going with the bourbon and whiskey tasting? Oh man, you know it's like, and the question is posed, right? What do you nerd? What do you like to nerd out about? Yeah, what do you like to nerd and, out about? Yeah, yeah. And so I, I have to admit, there's not been a lot. I've been nerding out on driving my kids to hockey and soccer and writing this book. That's what I've been nerding out about. So, yeah. and I still love my bourbon. And uh, unfortunately, you know, I happen to be one of these people that likes a specific parent company known as Buffalo Trace. And so sure. I love all their stuff. I just do. It's not necessarily cool to say that you like that because everybody likes Pappy. Everybody likes Blanton's, but I just like it. I can't help myself, but I'm also not willing to pay uh, an exorbitant amount of money because as much as I like it, I'm, I'm just not going to do that. Right. I'm not going to spend like $160, for a bottle that I could get two years ago for 40. Right. I'm just not willing to do that. And so but I, I found myself less nerding out about it and more just like, hey, this is good bourbon. And I'm just going to I'm going to just burn through the stockpiles I have right now and then just continue to buy the, the, the good bourbon that's still readily available on the shelf. So so you're you know. saying uh, I'm I'm I like bourbon. I like whiskey, but I'm not I'm not a connoisseur like you. Are you saying because of covid that the prices have gone up because the production stopped or what do you mean by that? No, I'm not saying that at all. I'm saying it's become so trendy, you know, and I'm guilty, oh. right? This started a couple of years ago for me, a, a friend of mine, his wife put together a bourbon trip for his 40th birthday. We went down and did the bourbon trail in, in Kentucky. And from there, I was kind of hooked on it. And as it starts to grow and grow, you, you know, there's certain like must have bourbons. And the bourbons I like happen to fall into that category. Mm -hmm. And so people just start cleaning them off the shelves and then they put them and resell them sometimes on the illegal secondary market. Uh, but yeah, or, or just at, at the super high prices at, at liquor stores. Um, and I don't think much of that is to do with COVID, maybe some of it, but I think most of it just has to do with the demand for that type of stuff right now. Gotcha. Gotcha. Thanks, Steve. I just want to check in with you because, yeah, that was uh, that was one of the things we talked about. Not only did we talk about, we were we were um, enjoying some inebriations while we were on the podcast at the time. I know this will be tough to beat. I remember that was that was, that was very, great. 
That was fun. I, I did have to, um, during COVID, I did have to go ahead and put myself on a little bit of uh, whiskey. <laughs> it's getting a little too liberal with the usage. So I had to yeah. dial that back. Yeah, I, I actually was listening to the end of that episode, and I think by the end, you could probably tell we'd each had a couple. It was a little bit longer episode. We were having a lot of fun. We're recording this at 11 a.m., and I don't generally drink whiskey at 11 a.m. I, I mean, I, I have. I, I'm not today, though. Well, I got to save myself up. I'm taking my son later today down to the uh, to Dead & Company at Wrigley Field in Chicago. I just for, saw uh, Dead & Company at Bethel Woods um, uh, August 28th. Awesome. It was, yeah. it was the best. It was the, so I'm not a deadhead at all. In fact, I was like, these songs all sound the same. And I'm a huge fan now. Okay, John, well, that's John, good. John Mayer, phenomenal. He's perfect for that role. Like it, he, people that don't like John Mayer will be like, he's perfect. He's so, See, he's so good in that role. I'm going to give him a fair shake. I'm a huge, I've never seen dead and company, but I'm a huge, uh, Jerry fan. Grateful dead and huge Jerry fan. Most of my friends know that about me. Yeah. Um, but I'm going to try to be objective. Keep telling myself it's not, it's not a grateful dead show. It's something else. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I'm <laughs> hopefully I successfully manage those expectations. Yeah. Just the, the wrap with this thing, the feedback that I have gotten from people that love the dead and reading reviews it actually is pretty much like a dead show. Like other okay. than John's voice, he's as good a guitar player as Jerry. He actually, I was, I was watching an interview with him and Bob Weir on 60 minutes in 2017. And John was talking about his process to like actually learn how to play like Jerry. Cause Jerry has a very unique guitar playing style. Yes. And um, it's, it, it's pretty, it's quite unique as a guitar player. I know you play a little guitar too. Like the things that he does is mostly swings and he's plays a lot of like, um, major stuff but he has a lot of like chromatic stuff in there and bob weir's like you know we knew john was our guy because he could handle it and when you mm -hmm. when you hear and i've been listening to a lot of dead and on spotify it and i listen to the dead it's very similar um what's your favorite dead song uh i, I my favorite dead song is a uh, when done to my liking is uh stella blue because i feel like it's such a uh there's so many peaks and valleys with it it's a very mellow slow song but when Jerry does his, and he does kind of a, a rocket, like distorted type of solo in the middle, followed by a very kind of, if he extends the solo uh, at, the, at the end solo, very melodically beautiful. And if he does it right, and he does it long, the longer version of that song. Yeah, I really, really liked, I, I saw it for the first time uh, live at RFK Stadium in 1991. And I, I heard that song and that's what kind of hooked me on the dead. For, yeah, that's, that's cool, man. Um, last thing, uh, sorry, I do have one more thing in this. I saw them with some friends at Bethel Woods, which is a site of Woodstock. And you know, for those who've seen the dead, they don't really talk. So they don't come out there like, we're the dead. And this is, the, they don't do any of that. It's like, they come out, they play music, they barely talk. But Bob, to start the second, the, after the intermission came out, he said, hey, we're going to try doing something that we tried to do 52 years ago, right over there that didn't work out so well. Because if you know the history of Woodstock, Grateful Dead played there and they just, it didn't work very well. They had some sort of technical difficulties. Yeah. And so they played the same five songs in That's the awesome. same order. It was super cool. And I mean, that is super cool. They that, obviously that, that, crushed it. Yeah. Well, that, that, you're lucky to be, uh, be there for that. That's, that's really neat experience. Yeah. Right, I, can, I can only imagine for, I can only imagine for the original members, how surreal to be back after 52 years playing in like the, the amphitheater at Bethel Woods. It's like an eighth of a mile from where the original stage was. And you can see it. So you're like, 52 years ago, we were playing over there at this thing called Woodstock. And now we're here. It's got to be, it's got to awesome. be so surreal. Um, so Steve, for those who haven't listened to our first episode, I'd love if you'd give us what you can, because there's a lot of things you likely can't talk about just a little bit about your military background, what led you to, to the Navy, kind of like your, your path. Um, Cause I know you, you know, you were overseas. You also led some training programs. That I think is interesting. Just get maybe like five to 10 minutes on kind of your path which then we'll, from there we can move into like what you're up to today, how that all lends itself to all the things you're up to, like writing a book, speaking, um, coaching, consulting, those things. Yeah, for sure. Feel free to uh, jump in and interrupt me uh, at any I'm time. A little, I'm a little scared to do that, but you're, you're virtual. So I guess. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, you know, I, you know, and I think I covered this, but uh, for those of that didn't listen to the first episode, it's uh, I joined the Navy right out of high school at age 18 enlisted and I wanted to be a SEAL. Uh, you know, I'd plan to go to college. I'd plan to try to get a, a commission in the Navy, but I had an uncle who was very influential in my life, my uncle Jack, and he was a retired Naval aviator and uh, airline pilot. And he said, 
you know, if you're just going to be spending your whole time in college looking out the window wishing that you were doing the thing you want to do, then maybe that's what you should just do in the first place. And, and so I took mm. that advice. My parents weren't very pleased with that, to be honest, but I took that advice. And, you know, I also I wasn't very good academically, to say the least. And I really, really sucked at math. And so I actually missed the qualification score to qualify for that program, to qualify for SEAL training by a couple of points. And so I ended up instead of going to SEAL training after boot camp, I went to go work on submarines at a shore facility in, in Connecticut for two know, years. That's Groton, Groton, Connecticut, isn't that, it? That, that's right. That's right. Yeah. Groton, Connecticut. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I made the best of it. I had some great friends up there and and I fell in with a good mentor that I think like, you know, I'm not one of these people that loves that cliche, everything happens for a reason. But in this case, I believe that to be true in the sense that I fell in with a good mentor and he kind of really, uh, as I added a couple of more years of seasoning and maturity and physical uh, growth as well, in terms of my physical fitness ability, I, I feel like that really helped me enable me to be successful when I finally did go out there uh, in, in 1995. And so I graduated I uh, spent most of my time on the East Coast SEAL teams, uh, deploying to all, all over the world, uh, you know, having having a, a lot of fun before 9-11, uh, going mm. to Europe, going to the Middle East, uh, doing a lot of training, doing a lot of partner uh, engagements with our with our peer special operations units. Uh, 9-11 happened and, uh, you, you know, did, did my deployments, uh, did some deployments to Iraq and Afghanistan, a few other places, um, but really enjoyed it. And then, you know, I, I would say, though, you know, if I look back and say, how, how was I able to best contribute to the war effort, to the Navy, to the SEAL teams, it was through my, my training efforts. When I went through and ran assault training, close quarter combat, urban warfare training, and then, you know, where I finished out my career, which was at, at the Navy training center, Navy boot camp up in Great Lakes, which was developing a program called Warrior Toughness to make our sailors and young officers be able to, you know, perform under the pressures of combat and just be better sailors and better, better humans, uh, mm-hmm. you know, upholding uh, Navy core values of honor, courage, and commitment. So that, that's a real quick snapshot. Yeah, that's cool. Is so now that you're retired, is the program that you created, is it still something that exists there? It is. It's still growing. Um, you know, the big thing, we started it in boot camp, right? It was and very much just kind of a proof of concept. We we created a program myself, a Navy chaplain and a clinical psychologist, right? I always make the joke. The three of us got locked into a room and, uh, and basically said, Hey, figure this out. And so we there's, created a joke, a program. there's a, there's a joke there somewhere. Yeah. And we always talk about that, but we were never able to kind of, uh, yeah, a, a seal, <laughs> a chaplain and a, and a psychologist walk into a bar. Right. But yeah, we could never come up with a satisfactory punchline, but, uh, we, you know, we created that program just for the kids in boot camp. And I say kids, you know, but they're, they're 18, 20, they're mostly kids to me. Uh, and then we started slowly expanding it to the officer community, ROTC, uh, OC, Officer Candidate School, OCS, and then pilot programs, the Navy Nuke School and places like that. And they're still trying to uh, work on getting it out there. And they're still, um, it, it's still, it's, it's successful. It's, we ran studies in control groups and proved that it was successful. And they're still, they're still expanding and still growing. It's a slow process, but yeah, it's still happening, which is very heartening to me. Yeah, that's awesome, man. Is it, um, is it like mental conditioning or what, like what, what, if I was to be in the Navy and go through that program that you helped create, what would I, what would I come out of on the other side with that I didn't have before? No, it's a great question. And so where I, where I taught specifically was that, you know, right at the Navy's boot camp, they have, uh, you know, the drill sergeants in the Navy are called recruit division commanders. And so they go through a special school at the Navy's boot camp to learn how to do that job. Uh, and it's a very difficult, very difficult job, very demanding job. And so I taught them when they went through the school to be recruit division commanders, I basically trained the trainer. And so if you go through boot camp, essentially my contribution was I developed the framework, what I call the warrior mindset, which is consists of commit, prepare, execute, and reflect. And within that, we onboarded performance psychology, mindfulness some practices of ancient uh, Greeks and Romans, uh, Stoicism, as well as just fundamental character development, uh, personal philosophy, values, uh, principles, et cetera. Uh, and, and then we would teach the recruits at specific areas where they would be stressed out. We would introduce what we call just-in-time performance psychology exercises, things such mm-hmm. as mental rehearsal, uh, self-talk, 
and arousal control or energy management. When you get really, really scared, we teach them how to cope. Right. And so in training, you want to push people to the edge of the cliff where they feel that stress. They feel that just overwhelm and you actually just shut down that fight, flight or freeze. But then we want to pull them back and then we want to teach them how to cope. So the next time they're on a ship and they're fighting a deadly fire or or there's missiles from an enemy ship, they're able to kind of lower that energy, focus on what they need to do to help fight back and help, you know, fight that fire. And so that daily mindfulness training, character development exercises, those are all the core parts of the program. Yeah, that's cool. That's um, in the kind of coaching work that I do, we call that growing your edge. So it's the thing that it's the, there's like the, it's a proverbial wall that you hit that, that will elicit your fight or flight. And it's how do you, and it sounds like it's, it's a, you practice that in a, in a simulation environment in a training environment. So when you're there, you're like, Oh, I've been here before. And I know that I can actually push myself further. That's right. And the term we use, you know, is respond versus react. Mm -hmm. Right. So with, without Mm -hmm. training, without preparation, without intentionality, you, you react to your environment. And most cases that has a negative outcome, right? In certain elements, we need to be able to do that, right? We need to, somebody throws a basketball at our face, we react by ducking or putting our hands up. Um, but, you know, you think about that same basketball player, if, it, uh, if, they're, uh, if it's just somebody who's not an athlete, what are they going to do when somebody throws a ball at them? As opposed to the athlete who's been trained to catch balls, right? right. And so it's the same thing when we look at whatever we're trying to do, whether it's like, I haven't been sleeping, I'm stressed out at work and I have to go home. And I have people on the other side of the wall, that house who who rely on me to lead in my home, you know, they're stressed out a couple of screaming kids. I need to be the person that's effective in that moment uh, in my personal life, as well as, yeah, people are shooting at me right now. Let me respond with the training versus react with just whatever happens. I respond with, with, with trained actions, with being, calm, composed, poised under pressure. And so that's what we're getting after. And it's the same thing. It's the same thing when we look at that in a a traditional business environment as well. Yeah. Yeah. Are you familiar with um, Shed Helmstetter's work? No, I'm not. So he's, he's kind of considered the father of self-talk of positive self-talk. Yeah. He was, he was a guest on my show uh, a few weeks ago. I was introduced to him through somebody and he came in and spoke about self-talk that is so he wrote a he wrote a book i believe it's from the 80s that's kind of considered like the bible of self-talk self-talk and how you actually limit your negative talk how you give yourself positive self-talk and how you look for the best in each situation so my guess is even if you're not familiar with him the work probably got incorporated somewhere because that like doing research on him he's kind of the kind of the father of that school philosophy school of positive self-talk yeah, and I'm sure that's very true uh, because, you know, the one of the things in, the, you know, the, the people that introduced me to this and like I, I learned some of these techniques years ago at this program I went through in the Navy. Uh, but by and large, I became a lot smarter on performance psychology, on mindfulness training, on character development through my peers, through the chaplain and the character piece and the, the research that they've done. Uh, it, which is not religious. It's about like really upholding, adhering to your values, principles, and beliefs in times of uh, difficulty. And then, of course, you know my my brilliant psychologist uh, peers and, and um, teammates. They really did a lot of study. They looked at how where this was tried in foreign military units, in the Marine Corps, in the Army, and, and where you know areas that they did well, areas where they fell short, and, and really uh, used this information and, and used a lot of the information from the sports world, where athletes sure, been sure. doing this for hundreds of years. And so, with what I do, and in the book that I'm writing, is I I hate to use the term a mile wide, inch deep, but I like to say, hey, I'm not going to dig really, really deep into stoicism. I'm not going to dig really, really deep into clinical psychology, into performance psychology. But as I I look at it as an operator, right? When we get trained as SEAL operators, I I was a sniper and I was a breacher, meaning breachers are like you use explosives, torches, uh, manual tools to get through walls, to get through doors, to gain access to a structure. Uh, I know how to use explosives. I don't know all the science about the explosives. You don't need to. But what I do know is how to do the calculations to make sure I have the explosives that I need and to make sure that uh, everybody involved is uh, uh, safely far enough away uh, in terms of the distance from that shockwave. And so what I try to do is say, hey, we don't, here's what you need 
to glean some tips and action steps right. to make it successful. And also, if you want to learn, learn more, here are the people that you should talk to, just like the right, gentleman that right. you mentioned, right? And I offer that, like, hey, here's the resources to learn more if you want to geek out on that. Yeah, because at the end of the day, Steve, it's all about what's going to make your make the the folks who you're training. It's like, what do they need to know to increase their performance? And I, th I think this is something, you know, to transition a little bit, which I know we're going to talk about here is kind of what you do for businesses. It's kind of the same thing. Like, and I, and I look at myself in my corporate career is it's easy to go down a rat hole. It's easy to go down that rabbit hole. It's easy to be like, oh, there's this thing I want to know about. And you just keep going and you keep going and you keep going. And that's great if you're curious about it. But I think one of the down where the pitfalls of that is like, what do I actually need to know to be more effective in my role, to be a better, be a better leader, to be a better salesperson? Because I know you work with all different types of people. What do I need to know to grow my startup? Do I need to know every little last inch of science to this thing? No. Do I need to know how to wake up in, in the morning and do it for five minutes? Probably. So um, if you'd be open to it, I love the transition now to talk about, um, you know, what you speak on, more about what you're writing your book about. And it's, it's all right in the vein of what we're talking about here. Like speaking, the writing, you know, companies hire you to come in and do workshops. They can hire you to work with you one-on-one. -on -one. What kind of things are you working on right now that, that would be useful for, for, uh, for all of us listening here today? Well, you know, it's like my military experiences has given me a lot of, you know, again, we always, I always, Navy SEALs are always the ultimate, like jack of all trades, master of none. And, and within that, I've learned a lot of things. I've learned Is that a true, lot. Though? Is that really like, it's so funny you say that because I think of a Navy SEAL who's a sniper and is a breacher. And I know it both. I obviously know what a sniper is and I know what a breacher is. I look at that as like, you're probably one of the better snipers in the world. Like you're probably, if I was to take everybody who considers themselves a sniper in any branch of any military in the world, you're probably in the top 1%, but you're like, oh, you're not, but you're not like, I see like a Navy SEAL is like the best of the best at what they do. But you just said you're a master of none. Is that true? Well, we do a lot of things really, really well, right? Like we are, <laughs> you're, just, you're just damn good at all, but that's what's going on. And that's not entirely true. I yeah. mean, I recognize expertise where that exists because some people specialize. Uh, Navy SEALs are really, really good at assaulting targets uh, in, in an urban warfare setting and adapting to a land warfare setting. And we are the only people in U.S. special operations that have a combat diving capability. Other special mm -hmm. operations forces will use, uh, you know, rebreathers, which are like the bubble free, uh, yeah. basically bubble free scuba gear, right? Yeah. Uh, they'll use that to get, go over the beach, right? It's like, okay, I'll launch from a boat and I'll use my scuba gear to, to for insertion and exfiltration of an objective. But we're the only ones in the military that will do, we'll go into a harbor that will put something uh, on a ship that can take pictures, that can do that active, like direct capability uh, from underwater, right? We're the only ones yeah. that do that. And so, yeah. you know, but with that, so we've got to have that capability. We've got to have an over the beach capability. We've got to have a land warfare capability. We've got to have um, an air capability. And so it's easy to get spread really, really thin. In fact, yeah. during the height of the Iraq surge in 2006, you know, we were focused so heavily on getting guys the max training for survivability and effectiveness on a battlefield in an urban setting in Iraq that we had really allowed some of our maritime skills to atrophy. And so we had a lot of reinvestment to do when we started kind of winding down in Iraq a little bit. And we had to say, look, there's nobody else. It is our job to be capable, uh, the most highly capable maritime force in the military. And so we can't allow that to atrophy. And I say all that to basically say it's easy to get spread thin. Yeah. Um, you know, and we, so we'll ask for help sometimes like our, our, like they call them JTACs, which are basically the people that call in close air support, uh, yeah. to yeah. drop bombs when we get in, in, a, in a, in a firefight. Well, we have air force guys that are masters at that. They do it better yeah. than anybody yeah. else. Yeah. We have our medics, but we also have uh, air force medics that are better than anybody else at that. And so, uh, we recognize expertise and special, uh, you know, specialization when we see it. Yeah. So how does this all relate? to the work that you do as a speaker, as a, you're, you're an, you're a, you're an author in, I don't know what they call you. You are an author because you are writing something. You don't have a published book quite yet, but I'll call you an author. You're an author in process. Book, so I guess that counts. Yeah, you're like an author. You're an author with a, you're yet unpublished <laughs> like, author. 
a tadpole author, right? A tadpole author, yeah. How does this all relate to what you're going to speak about in the book and what you speak about to, as you go in and do work with companies? Like if I have a company and I say, I need Steve to come in and talk to my sales team. We're underperforming. We've got a lot of pressure. We've, we're trying to grow this company. How does this all relate to what you do as a civilian now? You know, so there's a term we use, Jason, in the SEAL teams called being on the X. And the X refers to, you know, as an example, the X could mean we're fast roping out of a helicopter onto the rooftop of a building we're assaulting. And so in doctrine terms that we literally call that landing on the X, or if mm. you pull up, uh, uh, from armored vehicles to the front door of the objective, that's the X right there. And we also use that term when we are patrolling down the street uh, in vehicles or on foot and the enemy ambushes us. We're on the X right there. And so we said, hey, a lot of times we got to get off that X because that's where the fatal funnel of so fire that's is. Like, so let me um, just, so what we're talking about now is precision. Like the plan is this roof is, I don't know, like 300 square feet. We're landing. We need to, to fast rope down to this spot on the roof, not onto the roof, but onto this spot. But then having the know how to say, hey, you know what? That's not a good spot. We need to adapt in the, in the moment. Well, X is a doctrine term, right? Because, you know, you may do, you may be, a, they also have other letters, right? You know, you have the X, you have the Y, which is uh, off the target by about 300 meters. And then you have offset, which means you're way off and you walk in. But the X is also kind of the metaphor that I use to say, hey, it's the most critical point. It's the most dangerous part of an operation or a combat mission, right? And so, you know, I use when I when I walk into organizations and, I, and I'll tell some of these stories about that and what that really looks like in a combat or, uh, you know, high risk training environment. But in reality, we all can look at that and distill that down into those moments in our life, right? Those moments where, you know, within our relationship and our personal life, again, where we're facing stress, but we need to respond and not react in a professional sense, right? It's that big pitch. It's that really uh, important client that you have to engage with. It's leading a team as a new manager for the first time. Those are the critical moments. Those are your X moments. And so let's mm. figure out what those are for us and then let's think about the skills, attributes, and character components that will ensure our best selves show up in that moment on that X, whatever that looks like. And so you know, the program that I worked in the Navy was called Warrior Toughness, right? We want people to be tough, which means to think uh, clearly and perform under pressure, to deal with a day-in, day-out grind of a longer deployment, long period, a long project. And then, you know... And also be able to take a punch and keep going. You get knocked down to face failure and setback, but have the resilience to keep kind of moving back, moving forward. And so I, I translate that into, you know, what I like to say is I'm very, I try to re relate it, right? Because, yeah. you know, you have a Navy SEAL telling these war stories. Well, no, here's how this applies to you. Here's yeah. how you can see yourself in the stories that I'm describing. And I, and I hope uh, and believe that I do a good job of that. Yeah. What's, um, now I'm, I think I'd share this with you. A company I was at, we had, um, uh, uh, and I think I, we talked about this on the first episode that we did. Uh, I forget his last name, Kenny. He was in, he was in um, Black Hawk Town, the Battle of Mogadishu. He was an Army Ranger, and mm -hmm. he came and spoke to us about um, kind of his experiences. And our, and I, it's he's a musician. I don't know if you know who I'm talking about, but he's a uh, guitar. Thomas Kenny Thomas. Okay. Kenny Thomas, I believe, is his name. Yeah, yeah I think he, and he was played by a pretty famous actor in the movie um, back in the early two, I think it was 2001, that movie came out, but it's funny because as, as working in sales for so long, you get, I've seen a, a couple of really powerful military speakers. And it's like, you're in for, for men, especially like I was enthralled by the stories, how it actually made me feel was like the stuff that I'm doing feels, it feels pretty uh, it's inconsequential. And I think it's maybe, and this is not about Kenny, Maybe I wasn't listening for how I can tie it to it because I was just so in, in, you know, like I was so like, well, this yeah. is a this is a story. I've seen the movie, like it's cool to hear the story, but like, how do we tie it together? So I think the um the thing it sounds like you do a really good job of is like, I can take Steve's experience, I can take everything that you've done, and then what have you learned that you can teach me that I can go and do to be a better salesperson, a better a better leader? What I hear is to be a better husband, to be a better father. Like this all everything that you've the like I said, the millions of dollars and the thousands and thousands and thousands of hours of training and real life experience that you have, there's something for us as a somebody who's not getting shot at, not jumping out of helicopters, not, you know, swimming underwater, but there's still lessons to be learned there. So yeah. I say, I say all that because um, I like to, if we're going to baseline this whole thing, 
and you had somebody in front of you and you had like a, a couple minutes to say like, Hey, like, let me give the one key thing that's going to make a difference in your life. What is that one thing? So in other words, you could kind of think of this as your wrap up to your speech or call to action. What's the thing that you leave your audiences with that they can take away? And what's something that you can share with all of us today that we can all take away and use immediately? Yeah. And that's, uh, that's a challenge for me to distill that down. But what I would, uh, what I would say is to be more intentional and be more consistent with how you face the adversity and the challenges in your life, mm. which means, and so if you peel that back, what it means is I need to be the person of character. I need to have the strength of character to bring my A game to adverse situations again, because anybody can, you know, pilot a ship in smooth seats, right? But the, yeah. the, the level of, uh, of character in a leader and a performer is tested when things get hard, when things get stressful, right? Is that leader going to lash out? at his subordinates, right? Is he going to lash out and wring his hands? Uh, is he going to flail, or, you know, or, or is she going to, you know, respond in the way that says, all right, let me take a beat. Let me take a pause. All right. I, I'm making some choices. I'm making some decisions that really don't align with my personal values and mission statement and my personal philosophy. So maybe I need to do this instead. Oh, and by the way, because this is really, really important, this thing that I'm going to do in a couple of weeks Here's how I'm going to use some skills to do that. Here's where I'm going to identify, prioritize, and attempt some mastery at some very fundamental things and lash that up with some performance psychology techniques to mm. make sure that I can really be calm, poised, and confident in my execution when I walk through that door. Yeah, I love that. I want to, I want to share with you, and uh, if you like this enough, you throw it in the book, and then, you know, just... I'll, I'll send you an address where you can send the royalty checks. This, this, this will be the uh, game you. changer for your book. I'm, I'm kidding. All right. I'm, I'm I'll half kidding. Goodbye. Well, yeah, we'll see. <laughs> um, so there's in um, in the coach training program that I'm a leader in, we have a thing that we call attack, suffer, quit. And so again, all, it, we call it attack, suffer, quit. Okay. And this is the, the premise is that all of us, we have an automatic that we go to when we're under stress, under pressure, facing adversity. Some people attack, some people suffer. And some people quit. And I actually heard you describe those three things when you were sharing about the leadership. And the second thing that I hear is another thing that we look at is coaches. You know, I both do coaching is what's, what's your automatic. What's the thing that you like, what's the thing that you are reliable to do left to your own devices without thinking and the automatic. And that's where you run into the attack stuff for quick. Oh, I know at the end of the quarter, I'm a salesperson and I'm, you know, I'm behind my number. My automatic is. And my pattern is that I am going to um, show up at work. I'm going to go home and it's going to be tough at home, right? I'm going to be attacking. I'm going to be frustrated. Or uh, it's the end of the quarter and I'm not making my number. Oh, it's time to find a new job. I'm quitting. Yeah. Or hey, it's the end of the quarter. I'm going to hide from my boss. I'm going to put in some stuff into Salesforce. that's going to be not going to, I'm going to suffer through this thing, hope for the best, go to next quarter. And so what I'm hearing, one of the things that you train on is how do you create that edge and how do you take a look at your automatics? And then you get a chance to choose who do I want to be in this as opposed to having it being chosen for you from your automatic. Well, and that's exactly right. I think part of when I say, you know, react versus respond, part of reacting is when we become fixated on consequence, we become fixated on negative outcomes and just the negativity that surrounds us when we face doubt and setback. Whereas if you take, you know, what I, what I think is you take some elements of positive psychology and you say, Hey, let me focus more on what I'm going to do, what I do well. Let me lean into, let me highlight the things that I am already doing well. And let me try to add some layers of other things that will support that. Uh, because a lot of times, you know, there's that cliche, right? Don't shoot all over yourself, right? It's yeah. people say that all the time, but we yeah. do focus on that. Yeah, I we don't do. want to do that. I can't do that. I shouldn't have done that. I should do this. When reality, it's like, hey, this is what I'm going to do. This is what I'm going to focus my energy on because it's the right thing to do, right? And at the end of the day, like we get in front of a sales client and you were in sales and you, you know yeah. this, right? And yeah. we talked about this. It's like, hey, I, I've got all this, this, this background noise about how I'm not meeting my numbers. And so that's driving a, a level of anxiety, which is manifesting itself in that conversation I'm having with that customer or client. Right. Rather, and it's, and, it, and it's taking me away from fundamentally what's important in that moment, which is maybe transactional because your job is literally on the line, 
But in many cases, it's advancing that relationship. And we advance that relationship when that customer, when that client thinks that you are really there to be of service and value of what their needs are, irrespective of whether that's this thing that you're giving them, you know, because you may not have that answer, but you want to be the person that can tell them, I don't have that answer, but I know someone that does because I care about your needs. And when we are reactive and when we're thinking about consequences and, and negativity, we're not able to do that. Yeah. That's awesome, Steve. Um, I want to wrap up here with how do I want to wrap up today? I'm not even sure. I'm just going to improv this. Um, I want to ask you because we talked about this on the, on our first episode, I want to spend a couple minutes on how the family's doing. So you got, a, you got some uh, kiddos, you, you mentioned some sports stuff. I, uh, I think I mentioned this on our first episode, but if I'm the hockey coach and I look over for those of you who see Steve, he's like, you look like a Navy SEAL. I've, I've been with him in person. You're like, you're in good shape. You're like, you know, like if I'm the hockey coach, I'm, I'm probably a little bit scared that you're going to start yelling or something. Like I'm, I'm going to be like that. I want to make sure that that dude's happy, but I want to, I want to ask you that. Um, how are the kids doing? How's the family doing? How's sports going for everybody? Um, they're doing well. You know, it's, it's funny. You know, my daughter is kind of like just always kind of has one foot in soccer and one foot out. And it's like, I told her and, you know, people could criticize this, but I said, you know, you're going to play a sport, right? I don't care what it is, but you're going to play a sport, you know, for the reasons that I believe. And I feel like, you know, you know, if we want to put equal energy into, into different buckets, then, then with physical fitness and exercise is, is a necessary bucket. I don't care who you are or how that, what that looks like, yeah. whether that's individual sport or whatever. Um, not that she shouldn't do other activities as well, but that's really important to me. And, and I think it's been really useful because the only thing really keeping her in the sport is that she loves her teammates mm-hmm. and she has a blast. Uh, you know, they plays in a, in a travel league and it's somewhat competitive. Um, and, and she's not the standout player, but she's having a good time and she loves the girl she's with. And to me, you know, there's that. And so I, you know, I don't care as long as she keeps playing. And my son is, is more competitive. You know, he's getting up at the gym at five in the morning now, and he's a small kid. You know, he's not, a, I happen to be a bigger guy. He's a small kid, um, but he's strong. He's athletic. Uh, you know, he's not going to, he's not going to the NHL. He's not, he's not going to be a grinder. He's not a grinder. No, type. But, you know, he's got, a, he's got good friends. He's got good teammates. And, you know, I'm just very, very happy. And they're doing, you know, fairly well considering most of they stayed home most of the year last year from school. Um, and they're doing fairly well. And, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm grateful. I'm blessed. And so yeah. very, very, you know, again, very pleased with where, yeah, where... that's, that's awesome, man. Um, I, I was smiling as we were wrapping this up. Cause uh, you know, like my family's at a, we have a different age, different age kids, but I'm laughing. Cause I feel like for a lot of parents, the kids did a lot better than the parents did last year. <laughs> Like the parents are like, I'm about to lose. And the kids are like, yeah, it wasn't so bad. I mean, I know it's not. Oh, the case no, me, my daughter was fine. <laughs> you know, it's so funny because my daughter, you know, it's, uh, yeah, I know it's so, it's so political. It's so controversial when you yeah. talk about masks and schools, but I'd yeah. say, I remember my, my daughter, she's been doing the, the, like she was at home and, and we're like, Hey, do you want to go? Like they opened it up. You can go back to school. Do you want to go back to school? She's like, no. Yeah. I'm like, well, why not? She said, because I, I don't want to wear a mask because then my glasses will fuck up. <laughs> I'm like, oh, that's you know, there's some awesome. validity to that. That's yeah, valid. but, that's valid. but I wasn't worried about it because she still like she was still playing soccer. And so she had that socialization aspect. And in terms of, of emotional health, both my kids were fine friendships. Yeah. And but I, I realized that that's not the same for for all kids. But to, yeah. to answer your question, yeah, I think they did better than you know, <laughs> a lot of parents before. are like, the parents are like, save me, save yeah. me. I mean, I'm sitting there ripping up the checks, right, for my uh, events that got canceled, right? And I'm like, yeah. Ah! Yeah, short-term pain, long-term gain. So, my man, um, last thing here. Uh, this is for everybody, all of us here. Like, hire Steve, bring him in. He's obviously, you can tell he's a great dude. That's why I have you back on here again. Um, he's a man of character, man of integrity, do really good work. You have a lot of uh, knowledge and uh a lot of support and a lot of things to give. So how can, how can people connect with you, learn more about you, what you're up to, and how can we all hold you accountable to getting this book out? That's the most important yeah. thing. <laughs> yeah. You can, you can send me some nasty emails if it's not out due to launch. Uh, I'm hoping by next, uh, by next summer. That's, uh, that's, that's how the X. Track right now. Next There's summer's a the X. 
Yeah, there's a couple of things, you know, I, I'm going to have to get the book approved uh, sure. through yeah. D and stuff like that. Not a lot of not a lot of military, you know, a whole bunch of military stories, but, you know, that's the right thing to do. Um, sure. Yeah. Yeah. But reach out to me and thank you for the kind words, but reach out to me, uh, Steve at Steven drum.com. That's S T E P H E N drum D R U M.com. And if you want to talk leadership, you want to have a conversation. Uh, if you maybe want to work together, I'm happy to connect. Cool. And that's for speaking. That's for, uh, you do like webinar, you'll do like webinar stuff. You'll do, um, speaking engagements and you will also work one-on-one with teams. You work one-on-one with, with individuals or with teams. Yeah, that's right. I do one-on-one coaching at a, at a very limited capacity, to be honest. Um, but yeah, uh, virtual events, live events, workshops, keynotes, that type of thing. Awesome. Thanks so much for being on, buddy. It's uh, great to see you. Great to connect again. Next time we do it, I think drinks will have to be in hand. And, Absolutely. Uh, best, best wishes to you and the family. Enjoy the concert and uh, go birds. I get, who, are the, who are the Eagles playing this weekend? This is uh, weekend two of the NFL. I'm embarrassed to say I have no idea. <laughs> I'm not, I know I'm a, I, I'm a poor uh, represent representation of Philly, but I am a huge Flyers fan. So I'll be, I'll be watching. I'll be watching them. Very good. Enjoy the, enjoy Den company. We'll have to connect uh, offline about that soon and take care. All right, man. Thanks so much thanks, for having Steve. me on again. This real, yeah. it was a real pleasure. Awesome. The talking to cool people podcast is brought to you by Jason Frizzell coaching. Jason works with amazing people who are looking to find and develop their passion and purpose and create their journey to wherever it is they want to go. Check us out at jasonfrizzell.com, Facebook, or on Instagram. Jason loves hearing from anyone who thinks it would be cool to connect, to be coached, or to be a guest on our show. Email him at podcast at jasonfrizzell.com or DM him on Facebook and Instagram. And now, back to some more amazing conversation on talking to cool people.